Hey everyone, Model Man Frank here. How y'all doing today? Man, I'm going to tell you one thing. I'm beat. I had a, a pretty productive day today. And I was looking forward to talking to y'all. Um, today's conversation is about the A-26 Invader. Um, McDonnell Douglas built this aircraft back in the ninth, uh, before the war. Actually, it was during World War II. Um, the aircraft came out in 1942, and it was another aircraft that lasted from the beginning of World War II and flew on all the way into Vietnam. The aircraft flew for through many different missions and many different roles. I think it's one of my favorite attack bombers ever built. I like it a lot. Um, it has a little bit of history in counterintelligence warfare. And for an airplane that only carried, in its, in its inception, it actually carried three people. It carried a pilot, a navigator, and a rear gunner. And then later aircraft carried only two passengers, two persons, which was two crew members. I'm sorry. Um, it would carry the pilot and the navigator or co-pilot um aircraft could be fit, situated with rockets bombs um the front of the aircraft had eight browning machine guns in the front of it or it could be uh, attached with a cannon in the front just like the b-25 was uh during world war ii plane really excelled as a counterinsurgency aircraft it could carry rockets bombs it had hard points uh, during the Vietnam War, it was the K version, um, which had hard points, um, could be could carry extra fuel. Uh, they re um, they redesigned it with better uh, props that made it a little bit more quieter. Um, I mean, the re the plane was a real workhorse through three major conflicts of the United States. Um, the airplane was developed out of the ashes of basically one of a, another great fighter of World War II, our uh, fighter bomber, which was the B-20, uh, I'm sorry, the A-20 Havoc, um, or as the British called it, was the Boston. Um, during the Lend-Lease program, uh, Britain got a bunch of A-20s, and they really liked the airplane. The airplane carried three passengers, three crew members, sorry. Why do I keep saying passengers? I'm sorry. Uh, three crew members, one in the tail for gun, uh, the pilot, and a navigator or bombardier um, or co-pilot. Um, it was a really cool airplane. It had a top speed of 317 miles an hour. Um, the A-26 was the replacement for the A-20 Havoc. Um, kind of a funny, interesting story. I'm, I'm, I was reading some of the books for this uh, for this podcast tonight, and the A twenty and the A and the B A twenty six B twenty six went out on missions during European campaign, and they went out missions together. And the biggest problem was that at full throttle, you know, or at seventy five percent throttle, most of the time the A twenty six would be ahead of the lagging A-20s, and the A-20 just couldn't keep up. Um, the A-20 had a top speed of 317 miles an hour. The A-26 had a top speed of 357 miles an hour. So it was a considerably a lot faster aircraft. Um, it really, the airplane could actually win. The engines were tuned right. And you had less weight on the aircraft. You could get the aircraft up to 400 miles an hour. Um, the wings were really built for speed. Um, the plane, uh, its real primary mission was bombing during World War II. Less of strafing and attacking. It was known as the Attack 26 model. Um, it's a two-engine design just like the B-25, um, light attack bomber. 
McDonnell Douglas built it in just a very short period of time, just like the last podcast I did on the AD-1 Sky Raider. Um, this aircraft did well during the European theater. Excuse me. It excelled in the European theater. It flew all the way until 1945 until, until Germany surrendered. Um, there were not many flying in the European, in the Pacific theater. Um, I don't believe that there were any at all. Um, I could be mistaken, but we, uh, you know, you never know. So I, I do have a couple of books on the A26. Uh, some of the ones that I do have are on uh, some of the different operations. One place in particular that got me involved on the A26 Invader was on the Bay of Pigs invasion um, of April of 1960s, uh, 1961, uh, we have. Um the Bay of Pigs invasion was a group of volunteer uh, ex-Cuban patriots that the CIA had put together. And they were going to invade Cuba to take it back away from Castro. Um, I definitely would like to go and cover Cuba on a totally different podcast and maybe even in... Uh, uh, have some interviews uh, to go with, um, especially with my father, who grew up in Cuba and uh, subsequently did leave around that time period when Castro had taken over. Uh, my grandfather was in jail, and it's it's really something that I've really been wanting to really uh, tackle in its own video. Um, I don't feel that there's a lot of videos on YouTube about the Bay of Pigs invasion. But yes, the A-26 did, getting back to the A-26, the A-26 did it, did uh, fly. They took off from Guatemala and they were to attack three different areas. There were a lot of losses, a lot of loss of life. Um, a lot of people did make it back to base. Um but the A-26 really shined its uh, muscle there. Um, I'm going to show you a book that you're probably not going to be able to find anywhere. This is a gentleman that put this book together. He was an A-26 fighter uh, bomber pilot during the Bay of Pigs. So this is the book itself. It's called Operation Puma. It is about the air war, uh, the air invasion, to capture the skies over uh, Cuba during the Bay of Pigs invasion. The gentleman that wrote this book, his name is Captain Edward Ferrara. Um, he was one of the pilots that flew. Um, he made the book what it is, and there's not, there's no, there's no copies. If you can find it on Amazon, great. Um, you may have to go to a different uh, source to find this book. Um, the book is full of a lot of interesting resources, and it is really does tell the history of the Bay of Pigs invasion by somebody who's actually there, not by somebody in the History Channel who just looked up inter, inter information on the Internet. This is a, a book that if you really want to get one, Try and find it. It's it is a really good read. Um, it, it's very insightful to read. This is why books are very important. Um, this is what he looked like. He's passed away so far. Uh, as I as I've known, he has passed away. Um, he was a friend of my uncle's, and he gave me a couple of books. I've given one around to different friends of ours. Um, who are also Cuban, so they could read about the Bay of Pigs. Um, one of the books that is really good out there about the invader units of World War II is Osprey's book, Osprey Publishing. This is a good book to read. It talks about the B B-26 and the A-26 invader. Um, it, it 
it's very insightful with a lot of information. Um, it talks about the history of the A-26 and all the different units it did fly with. Um, it doesn't give you background in the terms of what the A-26s look like. So this is what the A-26 looked like with all its gun configurations. Uh, these were some of the nose art. This is what it looked like if it was in a bombing roll. And there's a photo in here that I did see of its night bomber. It was painted black. Now, the aircraft actually did compete against the P-61 Black Widow, which was the Northrop Black Widow. It was a very, um, it was uh, the A-26 and the B-20, uh, the b Sorry, the P-61, the Black Widow, had something that was coming of age in World War II, remote control. Uh, as you see, my garage here, or my shop here, is full of Air RC planes. Well, RC was just, it was something new. That was new technology in World War II. You know, because of the war going on, you could use this a little joystick and you could make these little cannons on the top move around. So all these little cannons on the top, the pilot would sit back here with a little periscope and he could point and the gun was supposed to go in that direction. There were a lot of uh, uh, malfunctions that would happen. Sometimes the tubes would break in flight, things like that. And, you know, uh, the plane had to become into a turn into a fighter pilot plane. Um, the the airplane had uh, getting back to the remote control system. The RC system was the same system put in later on in the B twenty nine, and then later after the war, it was the same system that went into the B thirty six Peacemaker, which was a huge bomber. It was a nuclear bomber with reversed engines, uh, pusher props. That that's a whole other video in itself. Um, Maybe in a future episode, I'll, I'll make it I'll make that video about. But this, these uh, radio-controlled guns, here's a picture of it. Here's the periscope. There's the periscope. And this is the gun, the gun situation, how everything was. I mean, that's real technology there. That's basically what would later on become our spectrum or top of receivers into our RC planes. Or our TV remote uh, to watch television. We click it on to watch TV. Or our remote control that we use to close our garage doors. Um, that was where all this technology came in to flourish. Um, really good book. So the B-26 and the A-26 uh, morphed from World War II, went into Korea, and in Korea it really started to be used a lot. I'll show you. This book here you can get still online. You can find them used on eBay. This is Squadron Signals um, publication. Squadron used to book this book out. I don't know if Squadron is still doing so. Um, during the 80s and 90s, Squadron Hobbies was the big hobby shop to get your model airplanes from. And over time, of course, they lost wind out to um, Amazon. But now there's so many different types of hobby shops out there. You can get plastic models or fine scale modeling anywhere. But these books, they were really good because you could build... A different type of book, a different type of airplane. If you wanted to build the A twenty six Invader, um, there was the A twenty six Invader on one forty eight scale that Monogram and Ravel came out with. I built that plane. Um, I had to buy a conversion kit to turn it into a uh, B twenty six K with the. I'm sorry, not the K version. Uh, to build it into the G model, which had the cannon in the front. I'm going to show you. So when the aircraft, when the B-26 first arrived on the scene, it showed up as a bomber version, which had a glass co 
uh, had a glass nose on it, and I'm going to show you what it looked like. Uh, you can see it here in this photo. Right? Uh, there's these two models here. This was the... Uh, this one here was the uh, prototype, and this was the actual model with the glass nose on it. It had a bombing uh, capability. You would have a glass cockpit. And then they had the X-26A, which also had a radar dome to compete with the P-61. But for night operations, the P-61 won out that. But later on, did they figure out during the... Korean War that they can use the B-26 in the night rep fighter role. Um, the A-26 not only had the cannon in the nose, it also had the actual cannon, like I was telling you, also the 20 millimeter cannon that they would put in the nose also, which I'm sorry, it was a 75 millimeter cannon, which is the photo right there. You can see that cannon right there just protruding out. It had a, a little shroud over it to let the wind break out over the, uh, the nose so there wouldn't be any resistance. Um, here is the model with the 50 caliber machine guns in the nose. That's a lot of firepower count coming out of the front nose of that aircraft. So this was the most widely used of the A26 and the B26 model with those cannons and those machine guns in the front. I'm sorry, I do apologize. I was saying Browning machine guns. They were not Browning. They were 50 caliber machine guns in the front of the nose. Um, and the Browning machine guns, they were the 50 caliber Browning machine guns. Um, throughout the aircraft, um, they were also used on the wing. So each side of the wing would carry four additional guns. You'd have uh, two pods on one side of the wing and two pods here, and then the eight guns in the front. That plane was deadly. Uh, you had 50 caliber. So you had four times three. That's 12 machine guns barreling down on you. If you were in a convoy and a bunch of A26s showed up with that much firepower. I hope you looked. I hope you survived and uh, you found some place to hide behind, because uh, I'm sure that armor convoy was uh, going to be nothing no more, especially with the bombs dropping down on it. These are the gun pods and the what you would see on the wing, on the gun pods. This book here does show the differences. The early B-26 B model had a different canopy. It had a, uh, so you had a, a very low canopy. So the pilots would be a little bit smaller. But as the later B models started to come out, they realized instead of putting the canopy where you push it up, you push the canopy up to get into the plane or get in the plane through the bottom they actually made clamshell windows and they were bubbled. So you actually had more visibility to look behind you and look up above you than with the early uh, flat top canopy. And here's a picture of what the flat top canopy. This is actually, this is a better picture here. This is the flat top canopy. I mean, there's really not much visibility you could see. And see, it, it would clam. It would clam up forward, so it was a little harder to get in and out of. Um, the later models of the uh, of the B version came with, uh, as you can see in this model, in this photo here, you could see that it came with a uh, clamshell window, and the window was bubbled just like on this one. On this one here, so you were able to see with better visibility behind you. You know, of any attacking aircraft coming behind you. And if the you had a gunner in the back, he'd be able to take care of that that uh, that uh, fighter coming in on you. Um, 
the pilot's position in the A26 was on the left-hand side of the cockpit. On the right-hand side was your navigator, and you could have another bomber pilot there, but really it was a navigator and the bombardier. He would carry the, you know, he would work the gun sights and work your navigation, work your radios and all that. This is the pilot's station in the A26. As you can see, it's pretty narrow, but it was a, an effective weapon with that one pilot. So the C model of the A26 came out with the bomber with that glass canopy in the front. Now, these, nose, the, these noses were interchangeable. You could actually pull the nose off and then put a different nose. So you could, you could change from a 50 caliber machine gun in the front to a glass nose, or you could put a different type of nose on the front also. And it was, a, it was a, like a locking mechanism on the side. And there were a couple of bolts. Of course, you had to do some engineering to it. Your engineer, uh, your mechanics team would come in and change, make that equipment change for you. But I'm going to see if maybe they show one nose taken off. Not on this book. But if you look really well, you see that little dial nose right there? You could actually turn that and a couple of bolts later and some mechanical do's that you needed to do, and you could change the can the noses out on the plane. Here's a photo of the aircraft carrying bomb loads on the outside wing, where the hard points were on the wing itself. Something the A-20 could not do. The A-20 could not carry outside bomb loads. It had, a, it had an internal bomb bay that it could only carry. So, you know, getting this was a step up. Now, just to let you know, the A-26 did not go to Russia. The A-20 Havoc did, and the Boston did. They went to Britain. But this aircraft only stayed European side, and it was American-owned. Um, I do believe some British uh, fighter uh, bomber squadrons got it, but the Russians never got the hold of the airplane. Um, it, it stayed uh, during... The Americans were the only ones that got to use it. Um, Russian pilots more like the A-20 because of its ruggedness. Um, and Russia was doing well with the A-20s they had. So that was, that was you know, history was written that way, which was good. Also, some of the A-20s um, not only had gun pods, but later on in, diff in different models, they actually put the guns in the wing. So... So you could actually put gun pods on the bottom, yes, but you had gun pods in the wing, so you had more firepower. So the aircraft was, all intents and purposes, was a pretty deadly plane. I'm going to show you a picture of what it looked like flying in Vietnam. The aircraft, when it went to Vietnam, became a different bird altogether. It was painted... Black on the bottom, camouflage on top. The airplane would go out in the dawn, um, sorry, in the early afternoon, evening hours, and it would become a night fighter. Um, attacking positions along the Ho Chi Minh Trail, flying close to the ground. Um, it fulfilled many roles. Uh, the Vietnamese used it, um, but it was mostly manned by American crews during the Vietnam War. Um, it was known as the B-26K. And the aircraft went through some very, um, it was in 1963 is when the aircraft started to really show up there. Um, by 1972, the last B-26s in service had been turned over to the National Air and Space Museum. So the last of the B-26s were no longer operating by 1972, but the aircraft had actually gone a long distance. Um, I'm trying to show you a photo here. 
Oh, here we go. On the cover. Sorry. <laughs> That's what the counterinsurgency, the A26K, looked like. Just like that. I mean, it... I think it's a pretty aircraft. I mean, for an airplane that lasted so many years uh, flying back and forth uh, through different missions and to end its career on a high note uh, fighting uh, in a guerrilla warfare uh, and uh, going out with a bang. So, Korea saw the A-26 being used during the nighttime hours uh korea was really more of a jet war jets had already started taking over but the a26 still showed that it could actually do the job um it attached a lot of uh, attacked a lot of convoys along the 38th parallel and also went deeper into north korea it did fight uh it was more of a ground and ground support role aircraft just like it did in World War II. Um, I wanted to touch base right now, and that's pretty much all I can talk about with the A26. Um, I'll put in a link in the description box below of the different A26 uh, balls of kits that are out there and some of the R, uh, plastic model kits that you can find if you're looking for an A26 you want to build. Um, if you want to get any of these books here that I have, there's the aircraft number 143 squadron signal book. This is a really good book. It shows you all the different types of the A26 that was. Goes through the entire development stages of the A26. This is a good book to have. This is one of them. The other book that I forgot to show you is the Air War Over Korea. Also, Squadron made this book also. I'll put a link in the box uh, the description box below where you can find this book. You can still find this book on Amazon. Um, still sells pretty reasonably, reasonably cheap. Um, this is what the, the A26 looked like. Painted up in some funky colors there. It was a night attack aircraft. That would be a kind of cool paint job if anybody wants to do that one. I would love to see if anybody does do a paint scheme of that. Uh, shoot me an email with that picture. Uh, of your of your model and, and I'll I'll talk about it on the next video. I really would like to see it. But yes, this is one book you can talk get it. You know, explains a lot, has a lot of good information about it. Just to give you guys a heads up, books are really important to have. Um, yeah, we have a lot of information coming out on the internet. The problem is on the internet, you can modify the information that's out there. Books, they're a little bit harder to modify. It's really important to have books. So this is one book to have. The other one is 26 units, A26 units over during World War II. They have the Korean version of this air, of this book also which eventually maybe someday I'll get. But this one I really like the most. Um, it's got a lot of the battles that the A-26 was used in and its developmental history during World War II. And then last but not least is Operation Puma. If you can find this book and you do find it, reasonable price, I highly advise that you do get it, read it. It is a of a lot of information in the book talks about more about operation puma and what really led to the attack being foiled and how is it cuba fell into communism this is a really good book to have um i want to show you another book i got um as you I've told you guys before, I used to have a really good book collection. And over time, I, you know, gave some books away. And then when we moved, there was probably a shuffle. I think there's a lot of my books are still at my parents' house, um, which I'm still shuffling through and finding. And then I have some books here that I'm still going through boxes to try and find 
and completely unpack them. But this is one book that I know I don't have anymore, and I had to get it again. Got this one for an inexpensive price. I think it was paid 14 bucks for it. Um, you can find this book. This is an airtime publishing book. It's called Black Jets. It's got basically every you see, everything you see on the cover is what it has. Um, it has the Northrop Grumman B2, the Lockheed Martin F-117, the A-12, the YF-12, and the SR-71, and the U-2S, which is known as Dragon Lady. Um, also talks about the D-21s, which were the ones that were used as a decoy aircraft. It was the very first drone aircraft that was used uh, to mask the ever since presence of the SR-71 flying into Russia. Um, really, really cool book. It's got a lot of cool information. Um, I'll probably be doing a podcast. Uh, I'd like to read a little bit more into this book. Um, I will touch base on this book with uh, some of the uh, knowledge that I have in future episodes. But really good book. You can find it on eBay if you really book. Or you can find it on, I don't know if Etsy would sell it. No, you, yeah, eBay would be the best place to find this book. You can find it everybody. Don't pay $34. That's what the retail price was for this book. The price was right here, $34. Try and find it for a cheaper price. You can't find it. There's still a lot of them out there. So, um. Wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about uh, the about Cuba and the Bay of Pigs. It's something that I really need think needs to be touched on. But I again, I'll touch on it on a future video. I promise. Um, and I I'm I'm hoping that I can get my father up here. Uh, to come visit one time and we can sit down and I can have a podcast where I can talk with him and he can, uh, uh, I hope maybe many of you could join and ask him questions if you'd like about that, about what happened in Cuba. And during that, um, my father knows a little bit more. He knows a lot of the pilots that were there. Uh, people that he knew went, were in the fight. Uh, my grandfather was not in the fight, but he was part of the. My grandfather did uh, work in the Batista regime. Um, my grandfather had a role in government during uh, uh, Batista's reign, and also had a role in the government before that, um, in the democratic elected government. Um, I will, it'll be a couple of different podcasts that we'll talk about. Um, and uh, I, I, I do feel it's, it's history that needs to be remembered. And if I can lend it on YouTube, I think it would be best to have it here. So hopefully with algorithms and things like that, it won't get buried. At least there will always be a record of it. Because uh, people that lived through that type of turmoil in Cuba need to be have their voices heard uh, very much so so with that said for tonight um, cutting it short um, I really do appreciate all that could have joined um, I don't see anybody in the chat but I hope that in a future episode I will see more of you join um, I really want to say thank you to everybody that has joined the page and has watched me post my videos. Oh, by the way, one video in particular I should have gotten into more detail on it was about the F-16. Some people saw that I was struggling to explain it. It's hard to, to explain it when I don't have another video to post about it, but I will post another video on it about the F-16 and why it was sucking in that cold air or the warm air at the same time and why I was making those noises and things like that. Um, that's a video that I'll do and I'll get some other videos to show you what really is going on in that whole 
uh, uh, video itself. So with that said, thank you very much for joining tonight. And uh, we will talk next time. May God be with us all and have a great night. Model Man Frank out. Talk to you all later.